Uh, let's bring into view from the opinion pages of the newspapers uh, today. We're joined, uh, well, I'll go through them first, shall I? On those, Operation Yellowhammer, uh, the leaks there. Matthew Dancona uh, writes in The Guardian that a disorderly Brexit must be avoided at all costs. Uh, in the eye, Ian Burrell warns the leaked documents outline a bleak future that they must be treated with caution. Uh, Alex Massey in The Times talks about Brexit doublethink and the challenge of disinformation in British and American politics. In The Telegraph, Owen Patterson says Boris Johnson's message that the withdrawal deal is dead is good news for British farmers. Uh, away from Brexit, the actress Gillian Anderson writes in The Guardian that governments must step up as the UN begins negotiating the first draft of a global oceans treaty in New York. Uh, in David Simon's cartoon for The Times, Boris Johnson gives a, a sunny uh, prediction uh, for Brexit. And in The Guardian, Operation Yellowhammer is also the subject of its cartoon, as you can see there. Uh, with us today to look through all uh, those newspapers, uh, The Times' defence correspondent, Lucy Fisher, and the Brexit commissioning editor at The Telegraph, Asa Bennett. Welcome to you both. Good morning. We are going to start with the Yellowhammer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What should we say about it? Well, um, I think it makes for pretty grim reading the uh, documents, uh, the civil service um, projection of what a no-deal Brexit could look like, shortages of fuel, medicine, fuel, problems at the uh, border, um, civil disorder. It's a pretty bleak picture. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, Matthew Dancona's um, take as a sort of uh, nailed-on Remainer. He really... Um, hits out at what he says is the exasperating fastidiousness of some other Remainers who refused to back Jeremy Corbyn in trying to get this idea of a national, um, a, a government of national unity off the ground. That's finished, isn't it? The government of national unity, uh, it, 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 what, for a week or two it was in play as an idea seems to have been utterly ditched now. I mean, the, the idea of a government of national unity that is comprised only of 48% Remainers fighting for the 48%. You know, it's a joke. It deserves to die, and deservedly so, in a sense. Given that, you know, Matthew Dancona seems to very uh, wistfully be sort of saying, oh, if only Remainers would just accept to, you know, do a deal effectively with the devil, in that sense. Um, this is acknowledging the chances are slim, and says that actually the better prospects are for MPs to just whack through another bill to delay uh, Brexit yet again, and then what, of course? Because the, the, the whole thing is a mess on the government national unity malarkey, because Jeremy Corbyn's been basically asking Remainers, back me to be Prime Minister, and, uh, you know, seemingly trying to make them think it's just a temporary Jeremy Corbyn premiership, but obviously we forget the small print says, I will then call a general election, and obviously once I win a majority, you know, so I can have a government in my own right, then I will have the referendum that you so want afterwards. So these Tory MPs who are sort of, like Dominic Grieve, um, who are playing with the idea of helping him into power, you know, it, no wonder it's a silly season story. That's because, you know, we're now moving on to people like Ken Clark instead, again. Um, so and actually, interestingly, you know, there's nothing to stop someone who's not an MP from being nominated by Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we haven't quite um, gone through the, the implications of, of, of yellow, ha yellow Hammer fully yet. Um, there is an argument, is there not, that says actually, well, two things really. One, that this is not a worst case scenario. I mean, this, fuel shortages and perhaps underflying medicines, grim enough, but we're not resorting to cannibalism or eating domestic animals according to these scenarios. And the other is, I suppose, that actually, if the government is to manage expectations, it, why not be transparent? Why not, sh why not Michael Gove invite the press into the latest meeting with his ex committee and say, actually, this is what we're doing, these are the challenges at Dover and elsewhere, this is what we're going to do? Well, I think it has to be finely balanced, doesn't it, between preparing people, and one thing that the, these documents um, drew attention to was the idea of exit fatigue, because Article 50 has already been extended, people initially thought we were going to leave in March, now it's October, that the public aren't really prepared and that business, more importantly, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, haven't got their contingency planning in place. So uh, along those lines, you do need to make people aware of the realistic and some negative consequences of no deal. On the other hand, you can see the government's um, point of view when it's refused to answer um, FOI requests about what it's, what its planning is, that it could hamper some of the effectiveness of that planning um, if it was all sort of um, made clear, not least as the UK is still negotiating with the EU. 
and it's not clear whether the government it, you know is still trying to get a deal whether it's completely resigned now to no deal so that also impacts the need to maintain some level of confidentiality well on that confident of confidentiality point asa i mean you know the principle of leaking where we are reminded you could argue of the sagacity of Boris Johnson saying, I'm going to have a cabinet of people I absolutely trust. Yes. I'm not going to try and balance the Remainer leave wings of the party. I'm going to have everybody on side in the club hmm. and we, we won't get these pesky leaks. This is from the old, this is from the Anshan regime. This mm. wouldn't happen under my cabinet. Well, that line is certainly being maintained in the response to the leak of the Yellowhammer documents suggesting, oh, this is a disgruntled former minister. It's out of date. We're now much better. And yet the thing is, Let's put that aside in some sense, because of course they would say this, they would say that, you know, sort of, you know, who knows, regardless, it shows one thing, that if, as Brexiteers like to say, you just keep responding to no deal by saying, prepare for it, prepare for it even more, and so scale up the preparations, they are having to consider issues like this, and you know, so quite right they are tackling it. But obviously, it just still strikes me, Matthew Dancona's response then, is not to consider things that say, like, maybe they should bring back Theresa May's deal and pass a deal, instead it's just the most arch remainer options instead. I mean, I was more struck by personally, by sort of Alex Massey mm. and Ian Birrell's responses, where they talk about, let's put it this way, the sort of split language on no deal. So on one hand, it's, it'll be fine, we're preparing for it, it's good, you know, we're ready for it. On the other hand, is Boris Johnson saying, of course, though, we don't want no deal, there's a million to one, you know, it's not going to happen, we want to have a deal. And so how are businesses meant to feel when they listen to this? Because they're being told to prepare, where there's going to be, in the offing, a public information campaign, which Brexiteers are desperate to be brought Did forward. You said, tell Absolutely, <laughs> you know, fantastically big national advertising campaign to say, get ready for no deal, but then obviously it's a scenario that won't happen, so don't get ready for it, it's going to be very confusing. Confusing perhaps also for, for British farmers, but not mm -hmm. his own, Patterson. Yes, well, we all know that um, Owen Patterson is a big, big advocate of um, ge genetic uh, modification, um, which he, I think we've ditched that phrase because of some of the toxicity around it, he calls it very much gene editing here. He thinks that there is a whole wealth of options that the UK um, could invest in and pioneer if it is freed from what he sees as the shackles of agricultural policy. Um, I think he makes some good examples if we did want to go down that route where, for example, in France they miss out on 4.5 tonnes of maize production per hectare compared with the US because they don't use the latest gene editing techniques. But there's maybe something in the fact that a lot of British produce is desirable abroad because it doesn't, um, doesn't get involved in, in that kind of novel technology. Where I do take issue with Owen Paston is he talks about you know, w with the loss of the common agricultural policy subsidies, which are absolutely crucial for many UK farmers. Until 2022. Well, quite. But after that, obviously, a lot of questions about what happens. He talks about the ability to implement a bespoke support package for farmers. I think when you've got so many pressing demands on the Exchequer coffers from health, education, tackling crime, I'm not sure farmers would be anywhere near the top of the queue for that money. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm struck by the mention about robotics and New Zealand because New Zealand's farmers are very good at automation. They've got robots picking fruit. They also yep. have uh, drones. They're bringing in drones now that basically help herd sheep by barking like dogs. And so, for example, you know, imagine it. Um, it, it generally, they're making it happen. And so, needless to say, you're saying, look, the, all these sort of techniques, you know, the future means that we can have more progressive, um, better value, more productive farming. But obviously, let's put it this way. It's not going to happen overnight. There's a skill shortage for this labour in New Zealand. This is why they need to bring in the automation. New Zealand also scrapped all subsidies, didn't they? Famously, they went through this cold turkey process, didn't they, and said, mm. you are going to be the most competitive agricultural sector in the world. And they have become, mm. but at a tremendous cost on, on, by certain measures. I suppose that's why Owen Patterson would want there to be a no-deal Brexit, so that then we can retail, you know, reshape our regulations in that sort of fashion. OK, have we just got time for Julian Anderson? Yes, we have. Oh, yes. <laughs> on oceans. Well, you know, certainly she'll be shining a great light on the oceans. I, I learned so much now about how important they are. I mean, I could spend the rest of this section just reading off the facts. We'll go on, Fascinating then. piece. <laughs> you know, there are whales that have been alive for decades in the oceans now. You know. Since before Moby Dick was published in 1851. Oh, that's good. I know. And at the same time, there's a first, uh, you know, oceans treaty being drawn up in that sense. And look, I suppose given that Boris Johnson's meant to be an arch environmentalist, you know, green Brexit, that's what Michael goes very keen on. I'm sure the government should be, you know, lapping us up. Make a splash. Very good. Asa, Lucy, thanks both for having me. Thanks.